There it goes. Okay. It, it, take a second. <laughs> so it looks like I can see about the top four or five. Anyway, um, today I would like to talk about what the heck is that? Cancel there. Okay. Um, something went on my screen. So today I would like to talk about my history, which is six decades long almost in software engineering and what I learned in each, what I did and what I learned in each decade, what the general themes were. Because I think if you watch how the themes developed over time, and some of you will remember more of this than others, um, it sort of leads up to the present in an interesting manner. And you can see also repeating themes. So uh, I'm going to go through each decade, tell you kind of what I did and essentially what the themes of that decade were, as, at least as I remember them. And then after each one, I would like to have a little discussion or would open it for a little bit of discussion, uh, you know, maybe five minutes or so before I go on into the next one. So with that um, introduction, This is the summer of 1961. I am a junior in high, sc in high school. Um, and the National Science Foundation sponsored science summer schools. And this was in Northern Michigan. I live in Wisconsin. This was in Northern Michigan. And um, there were 45 of us. And right there is me. And we did a lot of interesting science stuff, but we did projects. And the project that I worked on was programming a computer and there was a computer in northern Michigan it was about a two hour drive from where our dormitory was and we were we programmed it we had somebody come in and tell us how and this was a case where you programmed it in assembly language in order to input the assembly language into the machine you had to translate the assembly language to individual bits and you know zeros and ones and punch the zeros and ones into IBM cards. And then you took your deck of IBM cards with each instruction printed at the right spot, which you punched. You didn't punch letters, you punched zeros and ones and you made sure that they were right. And you got, we drove in a bus for two hours to the place where the computer was and we got to put our deck in and we got one try to see if it was going to work. Essentially we were doing uh, some sort of a hello world Mine was, uh, what was it, uh, e to the n factorial, I think, or something like that. Or maybe it was just n factorial. But anyway, um, I watched as all the, my colleagues, you know, they put their cards in and nothing happened. And they put the cards in and it kind of didn't happen. And I was really concerned because talk about having to make sure you have it absolutely correct because you get a, only one shot. That's where you do lots of deep inspection. Back in those good old days, pre-assembly language, Inspection really was important and not quite the same as today. And I put my deck in and it printed, you know, and it printed the second one. And then it paused and it printed the third one and it was doing the calculations. I was so pleased. And then it kind of paused and they says, oops, it must've gotten stuck. And then all of a sudden it printed the fourth one. It was a really slow computer. So um, I think I got hooked that day when my program actually worked. I thought it was so cool to actually have written something and have the computer work, especially since it was just one shot. So back in those days, technology was really primitive. In 1964, that's when the IBM uh, 360 was announced. And hang on here. So that's, uh, that's the chip that was the big IC in that announcement. Uh, the first electronic switching, telephone switching system was installed in Schenectady, New York in 1965. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about that, so I'm not gonna say much more now. 68 was when the NATO Conference on Software Engineering was held. And the interesting thing for today is that it, it was called software engineering at the time, and it's always been sort of my title. I've never thought of it as anything else. I know Parnas used to want it to be computer science versus, you know, engineering, and there was an argument there. But software engineering was the original title of people that programmed computers. Here's the Apollo guidance computer. That's what it looks like. 
from the Computer History Museum, two sort of big boxes here, and then a display. There were actually a couple of displays of the same type in a couple of different spots in the in the module here in the spacecraft. And um, that's pretty primitive when you think about what we have today. But to get it a little more primitive, here is 1967. I just graduated from college and my first job was at Bell Telephone Laboratories, which had just moved to Naperville, Illinois. And as you know, in 65, I just mentioned, they put their first electronic switching system into Schenectady, New York. They were developing a switching system called the number two ESS, number two electronic switching system for suburbs, for smaller communities. Um, and I was to work on that. Um, the design goal for that project was a cost to install and reliability equivalent to the existing electric mechanical systems. You could call from New York to Seattle using relays and, and microwave towers, no problem in 67. Um, and you, we had those dial phones that I'm sure a bunch of you remember and maybe you know the cutoff is who, those of you who don't, that basically created the pulses that caused the switching stuff to happen. This was pre-touchtone um, because they needed this kind of a computer in order to do touchtone. Um, the reliability goal was therefore, because the mechanical systems that they had were so reliable, because if you had a relay goal, it didn't matter. I mean, there were all millions of, you just had one relay in a, a whole mess of relays in any substation anywhere. So the redundancy was amazing and therefore, the phone system was extremely reliable. The same reliability with a single central processor had to be a maximum two hours downtime in 40 years. That was very clear. We repeated it a lot. Um, I, in fact, read an article by the project manager some years later about that and, that, uh, uh, and how we met it. So that's like three minutes a year. That's, that's, uh, worse the, that's more reliable than five nines. So, here is what it looked like, the way that we receive the reliability is there are two processors here. So here come all those terminals from the phones and they come in with a scanner. And then it just puts the pulse into two different computers, which are constantly checking each other to make sure that they are doing exactly the same thing. So completely duplicated hardware. And then there was a, a place for alarms and, and maintenance and stuff like that. So basically the, the way the thing worked was to detect a mismatch disable the faulty unit. And then my job was to work on the diagnostics, which would then run to find a bad component. So we were writing diagnostics for cards to find which relay, which area of the card needed to be fixed by technicians and print a repair ticket. And the reason we had to do that was the mean time to repair in order to maintain that reliability was four hours. So in four hours, if your computer went down, you could kick out the bad part, but you had to have it repaired in the meantime of four hours. And um, basically then you replace the bad component and you restore to dual processing and boom, you're good. So the way that they did that was because it was discrete components, they basically did mean time to failure on all of the different components. And they had a pretty good idea of how much re reliability and what kind of repair times were necessary to maintain the overall system downtime of three minutes in, uh, 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 of two hours in 40 years. So did they make it? As I said, the project manager published an article in Computer Magazine some years later, and he said, yes, we certainly did. And in fact, you could say maybe that they did, but in 1990, there was like a routine failover and guess what? It began a cascading outage that went from one substation to the next substation. You've never heard that before, right? And um, pretty much half of the phone system in the US was down for nine hours. People thought it was a terrorist attack, honest, I swear, that sort of stuff. So we've seen this, this concept that you think you have a super reliable component in a network, but if it fails and then that failure propagates, you almost can't stop it. And we've seen electrical grids go out this way. We've seen all kinds of failures that are basically propagation across a network. So it was not quite two hours and 20 years. 
So in the 1970s, so we're right up at the end of the 60s, um, that's when ARPANET got started. And I'm just gonna go into that now before I do the break for the decade, because it's just a follow on. If you take a look at ARPANET, okay, here's the ARPANET in 1971. What these are here are interface message processors or IMPs. They were little mini computers designed by BBN, Volpar Knuman. I remember when we had at where I worked, um, we had somebody come and explain the design of that from BBN. And um, every university then would put a computer or two through an imp and then the imps were, were uh, talking to each other. If you look at this architecture, you see the exact same architecture as the number two ESS computer. This could be a number two ESS computer. This could be telephones and telephones, and it's the same architecture. It's the exact same architecture. All they're doing is putting IMPs where the, net, the Bell telephone were, was putting these electronic switching systems. So what do you got? You got something that's vulnerable to cascading failures. And, um, so what happened in 72 is Louis Poisson from France was very interested in this. He came to the US and he was looking at it and he says, you know, this is interesting, but I don't think these imp concepts are gonna work in Europe because we're a really kind of nationalistic area and our national phone companies are not gonna go in and you know, put imps in to switch data or no other central place. We, we, don't, we don't have any place to put those imps to take care of them, to make sure that they are the connecting thing that connect across the network. So we need something else. And they said, okay, good luck and sent him home. And he had this idea that it's really his fundamental issue was you had to make the host, the host computers guys right here responsible for data exchange. You could not have these imps doing the data exchange. And um, so he put together a network, which is called Cyclades, uh, which did exactly that. It created a host to host transmission protocol and got rid of this, basically this thing that's vulnerable to fail, got rid of that there. So you didn't have to have those trans switching systems anymore, which is kind of lucky because those were, those were, by the way, they're getting a little bit old. They were a few years old and they were showing their age. And so at this point, because Cyclades was in fact quite successful. Um, in 1974, when TCP IP was designed, um, Vinton, Cerf, and, and uh, uh, Robert Kahn took Cyclades as their model and decided that that was actually a better architecture. So their goals, of course, was each distinct network here had to stand on its own. It can, you couldn't have to make it put some changes in in order for it to do something. No information could be retained by gateways or routers, no global control at the operations level and communications on a best efforts basis. And they did that because communications was not on a best efforts basis back here in 71. So you had the ACNAC problem. If you sent out um, uh, something and requesting an acknowledge and it didn't come back, everything got tied up. This does not scale. And so they went to communications on a best efforts basis at the same time. Um, that's why you can never be positive that emails have been sent on the, on the internet. So that's the structure that came out of the work in the 60s. And that's what we came out in the end. And if you think about it, what you've got here is an, a lot of redundancy, a lot of local control and a, um, especially the redundancy that we had at Bell Labs or in the IMPS. And you also have um, uh, uh, sort of regulated interactions between the two of them. And you don't have a lot of dependencies at all. That's each network has to stand on its own. You can't have dependencies between the various networks. So here are the themes that I see in 1960. I'll show you these and then you can tell me what you think of it. So the first one is that architecture matters. And in fact, really breakthrough innovation almost always was predicated on a rather novel concept of a new different kind of an architecture. So first of all, the, um, the software with the uh, electronic switching systems in each, in each office, that was one architecture that made the phone company work. Um, 
Then there was the IBM architecture, which IBM 360 architecture, and the most novel one, and the one that to this day actually works and scales really well, is the internet architecture, which was designed um, in the late 60s, early 70s. Then there's, in addition to the Software Engineering Conference in 1968, that's the year that Datamation came out with Conway's Law. I remember reading it in Datamation. And um, fundamentally, he said, your system architecture and your organizational architecture are going to be the same. I mean, he talked about compilers and how many passes, depending upon how many people, organizational structures it had to go through, but it's the same concept. And we found that this particular system architecture and organizational architecture, you can it's not even something that you have an option of hoping it doesn't hold because it, in the end, it, it's gonna kill anybody that doesn't wanna believe it. And the thing that we learned about, which we have sometimes forgotten, but the internet was designed on this concept if you want a huge scale, like phone system all across the country, or um, you know, uh, inter, inter, interaction between universities on a network, you needed to have redundancy. You couldn't just have one thing. So in the telephone switching system, every single computer was completely redundant. And, and in fact, in the vicinity of 60 or 70% of all of the code in that software, in that um, computer, was basic reliability and matching software. It had nothing to do with the operations. Um, and you need isolation. You can't have stuff that's gonna have cascading failures. And you actually have to have local responsibility, like the local responsibility of hosts at the um, internet, because when the network goes down, you wanna still be up. So it, you can't just it's probably one of the biggest problems with the cloud right now is if the network goes down, whatever you used to be able to do on the internet, you can't do. You can't do voice recognition, you can't do whatever. But um, the whole idea of Louis Poisson was, I have to make the local area responsible for managing their thing and manning any messages in and out. So those are the themes. So anybody wanna have any questions or comments or shall I just keep going? If I don't hear from anybody. Yeah, this is Jay. If anyone has any questions, just go ahead and unmute and ask your question. I would say before anyone else says anything, all these things that you just summarized is what we're trying to do now with Agile and Scrum and organizations and people. Conway's Law is very real today. Uh, for all of those who don't agree, please speak up. But I find this very interesting that we're still struggling with scalability uh, with with agile and teams and people because, you know, they're people and not machines. Right. Right. And, you know, as Conway's law is interesting. One of the things I see is sort of we already know how knew how to do scale. We figured it out in the 70s. Um, and I see all this stuff about scaling. And what I don't think works is to try to scale process for process sake. You scale process for something else. So when we talk about anything like scaling agile, I just think we're having the wrong conversation. We need to talk about scale architectural concepts for scaling. And I've never seen any serious scaling work without a fundamental architectural concept and an architectural uh, underpinnings. And in the end, anything that actually looks really highly scalable turns out to look pretty much like the internet. Hey, Mary, this is Michael. Um, thanks so much for doing this. It's really great to hear your experience. And you're a few years ahead of me, but um, you know, in banking, which is where I spent most of my time in the 60s, it was starting to program uh, check sorting machines. Yeah. And what was cool about that, so I got to know those people and they're fantastic. Um, and they're very, very close to the business. So one of the things that struck me was thinking about how we think about actually doing the work. In the 60s, the, these programmers lived with the people who were arranging yeah. the plane flights to move the checks around, right? And they had to work all the time with the people who were scheduling the, the actual people to do the other do the error correction work and that kind of thing. So they were so embedded with the business and it wasn't really a separate thing. I mean, software right. wasn't separate from the business, right? 
I love to hear you say that because when we get back to today, that's where we're heading. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So there's kind of this it's about curve. time we went back there. <laughs> yeah, so there's kind of this curve where we think about software as a technology of kind of, you know, um, very specialized and not embedded with the business as much. And now the business is essentially run by software. So yeah. how do you create that linkage with the business and the technical skills? Is you don't have a thing called the business. Throughout, throughout your talk. Okay, if you actually are in a company where there is a thing called the business, it's time to move on. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean necessarily you, I mean the company. But yeah, uh, I, mean, just, I was just thinking business lines, so. Yeah. Well, I know you guys are in like enterprise level stuff, but still, I promise. I'm, <laughs> this is not the first time we're gonna talk about that because that theme comes back pretty in the late, in the 2000s. Yeah, I want to hear you talk about that as the time goes on. Is, that's is cool. Right that was that's really neat to hear because yes, people didn't have there weren't separate IT departments yet. Yep. They came in the next decade. Although I never actually in my whole career was ever in an IT department ever. So that was that's I have a very strong bias towards engineering departments where I grew up. But I'll show you now. Great. Let's go into the seventies. All right. So it's hey 19... Mary. I have a quick question. Sure. Um. What are your thoughts on organizational architecture and organizational strategy? Can I hold off on that for a little bit? And sure. can you ask me that one again? I'd sure. like to talk about it, but I want to wait till I get into the like 2000s or so, if that's okay. Absolutely. Because I'd like to sort of set some of the scenes in first. But thank you for asking that now, because... And definitely that's one I want to remember. And if I forget, be sure and ask me, okay? So let's go to 1971, because I'm not in an organization yet. I was just a low level engineering programmer at Bell Labs. And um, then I arrived uh, at University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, where my husband was going to start a PhD program and I had a master's degree in math. I had gotten that after I left. I worked for Bell Labs for a year, got a master's degree in math after that. I had an 18 month old daughter. I had one year of programming at Bell Labs, the number two ESS computer. And because my husband was starting out a PhD program, therefore he didn't have any income. So obviously I needed a job. And so, um, where I got a job was working for Murray Thompson, who is a professor of high energy physics, and he was this digitizing bubble chamber film in his university lab. Um, and the work that he did on that is called the Aladdin Project, led to a lot of the stuff um, that happened later on, where he took over the lab that designed and built computerized experiments for all kinds of different things, both at that university and in the whole community of high energy physics. So here's me in 1973 with my um, next kid, my son and my daughter. And I believe that this was during an ice storm when we all went down on campus because that's the only place there was electricity. And uh, some of the equipment, it's not the computer I program, but this here is a garbage bin. And that's where we threw our paper tapes after we were done using them. So um, that's what happened in 1971. Now, also at the same time, out there in your area, Xerox Park got formed, and uh, the graphical user, I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys this, but I, most people don't actually, haven't been around long enough to remember this. Um, the graphical user interface was developed there. They developed bitmap displays. What you see is what you get. Editing, overlapping windows, mouse, menus, icons. Um, and basically they invented interactive computing. They built the first personal computer kind of by hand. They, they invented desktop publishing, laser printing, uh, small talk, ethernet. And interestingly enough, you probably know this also, Xerox was only able to commercialize one of those guys. Which one? Anybody know? Printer. Laser printing. Yeah. I mean, because they had these big copying machines, so they, they commercialized laser printing. But that was it. They did not have the organizational structure that had any ability, even though they were formed to imagine. Xerox was a massively successful company, huge, one of the big icons in the industry at the time. 
And they wanted to figure out where the office was going in the future. That's why they formed this lab. And they did figure out where the office was going in the future, but they did not have the structure. They didn't have the, the business um, uh, concept of selling this kind of stuff. Their, their selling was based on very high uh, commissioned salesmen distributing uh, great big machines. And this kind of thing involved in a completely different method of making money that they couldn't switch to the, get their minds around. The rest of the company couldn't. So uh, these things spun off and all sorts of other stuff that's all around you even to this day. Um, in 76, I wasn't there. I was an engineer for a year at General Motors. And they hired me into their driverless vehicle program. Yes, the driver, there was a driverless vehicle program in General Motors in 1976. We were doing wire following. So you put a wire down, say, in a warehouse or, or say, um, between two airport terminals or something like that. And we had to do both wire following and cruise control. And the problem was that cruise control between zero and 30 miles an hour had not yet been, uh, per, let's just say, you couldn't do it. There was some research in the area. I mean, y'all know when an elevator stops and bounces that they don't have their zero to three miles an hour part done. But that was a very tough problem. And um, so, uh, they had bought a TI-990 mini computer that couldn't even do high level languages, which I had been using at the University of Wisconsin, but um, I could do assembly language too. So that wasn't a problem. And I was supposed to program this TI-990 to do the algorithms that their engineers told me to do to do the cruise control for the startup and the sh shutdown. And it didn't work. I mean, we would put the the software in the test computer, we drive out to the trust tech, test track, there was a driver that could take over control of the vehicle. We try it and it would go zoom in and it slam on the brakes and go zoom and slam on the brakes. And, and it just wouldn't work no matter what I did. And I was so sure that I could not find any errors in my software. So I went to the engineers and I said, well, couldn't you just you know, look at this algorithm and explain it to me? Um, so I could see it and they said, now nah, we don't have time for that. It's got to be your program. It had to be because it was assembly language, right? So how could it not be? So I could not find the error. So I bought this book. This is a copy of it. You can see it's kind of well-worn. Um, it's the college text that the nearby university was using for control system. I read it cover to cover. I basically gave myself a college course in control theory in a month. And then I took a look at the algorithm again, which was in a published research paper. Um, and I decided that there was a defect in it and they had given me um, an order of magnitude error in the formula they gave me. I brought it to the engineers and I said, you see this, you know, this constant right here, don't you think it should be like hundred times bigger? Because here's the, the reason. And I showed them all the theory and they said, oh, you're right. <laughs> So we put the, the right gain in for the algorithm and guess what, the car works. So that's how I learned control system. Now, the, the thing is at that time, if you were supposed to program something, it was your job to figure out how to make it work. And if you couldn't get anybody else to figure out how to make it work, you, I learned control theory because what else was I going to do in order to figure out, I, I knew the program, I was pretty sure the program was right. If I could not understand the algorithm, then I couldn't be sure what, where the error was. And it was my job to find the error. So I had to understand what I was programming. So I studied control theory. That's kind of what you did. Um, you understood the whole thing that you were pro solving the entire work. I was only at General Motors for a year. And then I went to 3M and I was hired as a control engineer. I was very fortunate. I was already pretty good at control theory. And this is the kind of stuff we did. You can see here, if you've got enough video running, this is a coding process. And um, what we were doing was writing the software to run various types of coding control. This here is a beta gauge. And we actually invented it. And then eventually another company took over and started making them commercially, where you, you can see the little radon things there. You're shooting a, a, a radiation onto the web in order to measure its thickness. and um, so that's how the control system worked. And in about 1980, this is the way a control system looks. 
there is a mini computer. In my case, it happened to be a HP 1000. Um, usually, uh, oftentimes it was a DEC PDP 11. There was an operating station, which was a color display for the operator to control things. Typically there were lots of like charts and graphs on there and, and that's where you put in the set points and things. There was some recipe storage on a disk because you made different types of things. So different kind of product, you bring in the new recipe and then you stored historic records. And then we put in a database analysis of the historical records to find defects. Um, there was an interrupt bus coming off the mini computer and connected to that were various analog PID controllers, proportional integral differential controllers. So the actual controller of every control loop, which is equivalent to cruise control in a car, was on a separate analog computer controller. And all I did was I set set points down to it and I got back things like what's the speed, what's the flow of this information. Um, there were also PLCs, programmable logic controllers. When the phone company had all of these masses of relays, they developed a programming quote language for relays called letter logic. Does anybody here work in letter logic? So PLCs use that same letter logic to um, electronically code the same thing that you would letter logic you would do for any relay system and to manage all of the digital control in any system. Now, if you saw those tapes, they stopped, they, they got cut. Most of that is digital control. The analog control is the role. And then when you do the conversion into the pieces, a lot of the control is digital. So there, there were events. Um, I read events and I sent events to the digital controllers and the digital controllers were programmed by also by engineers in my department who are really good at PLC programming. And um, there we manage the switches and the timers and stuff like that. Now, what you have here, this is event driven, okay? Basically, you are looking at what's going on down there in the coding system and you send an interrupt to the computer to say, hey, it's time for you. Hey, I've just gotten to the end of the roll. It's time for you to do the cutting or whatever. It's object orientated. I've never understood why objects were not just kind of logical because what you're doing is controlling things like pumps and switches and timers and heaters and coolers and everything is built around those objects. And this is really important. There were edge computing. The reason is because everybody knew that that mini computer was gonna die all the time. Well, it didn't matter. All it needed to do was die once. There's no way you could depend upon it being there. So there was no way anybody would even imagine or dream of allowing a mini computer to actually control a device. You had to send set points, get back data. But the actual control was always completely local to the event it was controlling because um, we were controlling stuff that was explosive. We were controlling stuff that could be um, extremely dangerous. And the last thing you ever wanted was something that would, any kind of event that could create a catastrophe. So you made the assumption that if anything could go wrong, it was gonna go wrong and everything was designed in a fail safe manner. There's, there was no option. We had senior engineers that would say to me, well, and I was just programming the stuff they used to do in, in logic. And they'd say to me, so you can do whatever you want in the computer, that's okay, but we are gonna hand wire the emergency stop system and all the safety systems because we don't trust your computer. And that's what they did. <laughs> they, they built a, a manual safety system around the computer system for many years until they could really trust the computers. So here are the themes. One was the responsible engineer. So as an engineer, and this sort of relates to when, uh, when you were working with the, the card sort, the check sorting system, engineers are responsible for the design and development of whatever piece, like I was responsible for that mini computer and for making sure that my component operates properly and did its job as part of the overall system. My job was to understand the overall system, understand the interfaces with all the other people and understand how to program so that operators could reach, could be, would be happy with it and understand how to design a system that the plant engineer could maintain over time. And the plant engineer was not a computer programmer, but he was smart, so I used BASIC. Um, and 
the whole concept of responsible engineer is pretty common in an engineering department. And I was in a mechanical engineering department. So of course the engineers were responsible to figure stuff out. We didn't have somebody telling us tasks to do, or, you know, sometimes I look at the scrum meetings and I'm thinking, huh? You know, if somebody were telling me what was the priorities and what were the tasks when I was doing this kind of programming, we would have told them where to go because, you know, those decisions were our job. We were the engineers. We knew how to solve the problem. Nobody told us how to solve the problem. That was our job. And when you come from an engineering background like that, it's really hard to imagine an intermediary person between the problem and the engineering engineer solving the problem. We learned a lot about fail-safe design. Um, the first computers, serious computer programs that I did outside of the member to ESS system was the concept that um, things will fail. And if you haven't got things so that when they fail, nothing's going to go bad, then you, um, you, that's your first and foremost job. And the other thing that some of you may remember is this was the decade of structured everything. Structured programming, structured analysis and design. Remember that? Anybody? So there, I've got this many books with structured something in front of it. And the idea there was that you designed a high level system and then you put in the pieces one by one and you got each one working before you went on to the next one. That was Harlan Mills who wrote about it. Um, and he's the guy behind, uh, he was that uh, chief engine, the, the, the surgeon in um, Brooks. Remember Brooks's book, The Mythical Man Month? And he talked about the surgeon. Well, Harlan Mills was his kind of model. And Harlan Mills also had this whole concept that the way to do programming is to get the high level, like, you know, interaction, get the top level, just nothing underneath it working, and then add one piece at a time and get that working, and the next piece at a time and get that working, and the next piece at a time and get that working. Have you ever heard of something like that before? And, um, and at, uh, Dykstra, when he was talking about structured programming, said, if you want more effective programs, you're going to have to discover they shouldn't waste their time debugging. They shouldn't have to introduce bugs to, to start with. And this structured, short, quick introduction of programs so that you could tell if it was working or not was the way you did that. And so this concept of um, continuous integration with small changes isn't new, not even close. It's pretty much what, what, what this whole structured environment was in the 1970s. Okay, so any questions here or comments? Again, everyone unmute yourself and say something if you want. Okay, we can well, move hard, on. To the... It's hard okay. for me not to say anything, Mary, but this is what we're trying to change. I know you're going to get to the uh, 90s and the 2000s where this all changes, but yeah. we're trying to get everyone to change back to this, you know? So, <laughs> So we're trying to get, you know, Scrum. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, Scrum, Scrum should be about the people doing the work decide the work, right? And there's no intermediaries or that's the way Agile is. If you're not doing that, you're doing it wrong, right? Yep, no proxies. And, and, and so all of these things that you brought up on the last two decades is kind of interesting to me. And we're going to find out why we lost our way, I hope. Right. That. We'll talk about yeah, that. and I'm going to get to that one about organization, a question about organization. But so let's go into the 80s, okay? Now, in the 80s, I went to 3M. Um, uh, this is the tape manufacturing building. This is in Hutchinson, Minnesota. It's about a that's when Tom and I moved into this house. Um, uh, corporate headquarters is about a half an hour drive to my east, and the plant is about a 45 minute or 50 minute drive to my west. Tom had a job in the Twin Cities, so we built this house and I moved here and in 82. And um, I went out there and I was the technology manager in the manufacturing plant for videotape, which 3M has pair plants, sister plants that are right next to each other. And uh, so this is 82. And in the time that I was there in the next three years, we implemented probably the first just-in-time system in the company. Um, 
And it was because we were doing videotape, which had enormous competition at the time from Japan, who was making stuff that was faster and way, you know, half the price or third the price of ours. So we had to do something and we looked at what they were doing and they were doing this crazy thing called just in time. So we tried it and it worked. Um, we focused on, basically we focused on reliability, especially because this is a manufacturing plant and we were shipping everything we could make. So we could not go down. We looked at product quality a lot, not software quality, but product quality, a lot about safety. Um, because this was all of these environments were explosive environments and extremely dangerous. And then we did flow. So that's what just in time added. I want to talk about flow for a minute. Okay. So if you think about flow, I think the best analogy is to think about a perishable goods supply chain. So here's vegetables, okay, or milk or meat, you name it. And what this person is doing is bringing her vegetables to market. Now in a perishable goods supply chain, you never optimize for resource efficiency or for utilization. So she is not bringing her stuff on a bicycle to a truck and you fill the whole truck up and then you drive it to the market. Nope. She is individually all by herself bringing these people and, and this is coming from all over. People are on these small bikes and they're not consolidating and making the most efficient use of the trucks that you might have or something like that. Because in, in perishable goods, optimizing for resource efficiency um, doesn't make any sense. It's got to be optimizing for speed because that stuff is going to spoil. Um, you never accumulate large batches because your truck doesn't move anywhere as near as fast as these bicycles can get there. You um, aggressively discover and eliminate the biggest bottleneck because the fresher your fruit are is, the better it sells. You use whatever people buy to decide what you're going to do next. And um, you try to make that supply chain really short. And... Um, when you're talking about what to plant, you look at the feedback of, from your customers. So that's what a perishable good supply chain does. And if ever you wanna think about flow, all you have to do is think about how, well, let me tell you something. Here's how I think about it. We were trying to do just in time and we had a consultant come in for a day. And he said to us, one of the things that I'll never forget is he said, you know, if you really want to know how your plant should work, go down to Chicago and look at a Nabisco plant because they make cookies and that's not much different than your cassettes. And those cookies, they have to make them, bake them, package them, get them to stores, get them into people's houses and get them where people eat them in really short time. Otherwise they're stale. And if all you do is think about how cookies get made and packaged and shipped and so they're still fresh when they get there, you've got the whole concept of flow. So that's a, the, the kind of concept that we used when we were trying to figure out how to do it just in time. Other thing that happened in the 80s was user programming. So first of all, that's when personal computers came in. This is my son. He Remember that little baby? Well, now he's 13. And um, he is learning how to type at our house. He's taking a typing class and learning how to use our computer. And that's what it looked like. Um, the other thing that happened in the same decade was we had all these great fourth generation languages and report generators and everybody said, so who's going to need programmers anymore? These fourth generation languages will solve all of our problems. Do you remember that? Uh-huh. Right. Did it? It just made a mess. So basically, you know, as Dijkstra said, higher level languages enable higher levels of complexity and there's always a point at which it's too complex and people have to get in and figure out how to think. It lets you think at another layer of abstraction, okay? Or another layer of abstraction. But no matter how many layers of abstraction you get to, you still get to the edge of the complex system and then you have to be able to think. So we've never actually gone beyond needing some sort of thinking people to do programming. And I'm thinking it probably is not gonna happen for a good long time. So here's the themes in the 80s. This is what I learned being in a manufacturing plant. Execution really matters. You can't just wave your hands. You need expertise. Expertise is important. 
You need focus. You need attention to detail. And if you want things like reliability, scalability, usability, safety, and security, and you're not paying attention to detail, having people who really understand and are experts in the area, focus on the most important problems one at a time and get rid of them, then that's not going to work. When we implemented our just-in-time program, it was amazingly successful, but wow, is it a lot of work. Lots of attention to detail, lots of involving the people on the floor. So I really got an appreciation in the manufacturing plant about what operations, operational excellence really means. Um, the other thing is to focus on flow. And really, if you think about it, focusing on flow doesn't allow you to suboptimize because you have to look at the end to end. And the other thing is to manage throughput, not tasks. Um, and to this day, this concept of managing rate at which stuff gets done rather than tasks is something that is completely natural to me because I did a, a manufacturing just in time thing and flow makes so much sense. But to this day, when I say manage by the rate at which stuff moves, not how many tasks are done, people still don't quite get their arms around how, how much better a way of managing that is. And then we have Parkinson's law for software, which is uh, complexity expands to fit the latest subtraction. <laughs> Any more? We're getting to the 90s, so hey, the, we're getting where stuff goes downhill. <laughs> Any comments? Yeah, um, how was it that the airline, I think the airlines came up with hub and spoke about the about the same era, which is totally contrary to flow. Oh, right. This has nothing. That's why Southwest has been quite successful because it does. It's always been a flow company. Yeah. And uh, well, if you are optimizing resource uh, utilization rather and it, you know, on a, a narrow short term, you know, blinders on point of view, it seems to make a ton of sense to optimize the, if the usage of your resources. If you take a look at um, cost accounting, okay? So in our manufacturing plan, it was really hard to do flow because cost accounting is all built up on resource utilization. All of the metrics were on resource utilization. Uh, in fact, it was hard to get rid of inventory because inventory is an asset. It's a positive thing on the balance sheet. And so the, even the, um, the uh, cost accounting metrics are biased very strongly towards um, batching towards, and that's why you have hub and spoke, because your all of your economics, all of your cost accounting stuff. Um, you know, I saw this cost accounting problem. It takes it takes any industry like a decade or so for the people to start retiring that are in the old mental model of what is good economics, and then the new people that understand flow economics are better, finally come in, sort of like the, the you know, the structure of scientific revolution, re revolution, you have to, you have to get the people that have a different way of looking at it out of there before you can, that I think really, there was a lot of influence by um, very um, uh, short term optimization accounting metrics. We still haven't gotten rid of it in soft, still have in not. software businesses. Well, if you take a look at um, let's take shareholder value, for example, it's, a, it's exactly the same problem. One short term metric messes everything else up. So that's that had something to do. I'm sure that didn't have all to do with it. But but basically, if you are looking for something that is going to make your company look good, you have to make it look good from an economic point of view until you don't. But at that time, you did. And hub and spoke actually comes out pretty well on, on, your, on your bottom line. Because if there's nobody competing against you at a system level, which is what you need with flow, you need to have a system perspective, then everybody does hub and spoke. You can't see how it could be better. Except Southwest never went bankrupt. Well, Southwest never went bankrupt, right. Okay, let's go into the 90s. And this is gonna be really short because, well, I can't remember how, how long this one is, but the 2000s is short. So we went to client server architectures. Yes, for sure. So there's your presentation devices of some sort, and then you had application servers, and then you had a database server. Okay, 
Now, the reason why, now the, the problem here is that this is violating everything we learned about large scale. It doesn't have redundancy, it doesn't have isolation, it doesn't have local control. It has one great big single database, no redundancy. But it had to be that way because uh, you needed your transactions to be acid, which means um, they have to be atomic. Um, that means they have to be treated as a single unit. They have to have consistency. There's only one valid straight state. They have to have isolation which means you maintain sequence and they have to have durability, which is permanent storage. And the only way you could get that is in a database system. That's what databases provided. And if you had a transaction system, it had to be managed by a database system. And basically it needed to be on a single server because of the cap theorem, which says you can't have consistency, availability and partitioning all at the same time. You can only have two. And of course you had to have consistency and of course you had to have availability. So partitioning was bad, basically couldn't do it. And that's what everybody believed in the 1990s. Then because of that, a typical delivery process was like this. Because remember we have a single database and anything that changes, you have to check everything that connects to it and everything is connected in that single database. So typically in the 90s, we would have like a six to 18 month release cycle. Remember those days? And I mean, it was not it was considered anything faster. It was just reckless, yes. Um, and typically the mantra was you needed to code freeze about 30% of the time and then test. Sometimes that went to 50% of the time. The other thing that happened in that same time frame. Um, and, you know, I didn't actually realize it at the time because I was working on, on process and, or products instead. But um, then the other thing that happened because everybody was so desperate for the stuff was that they wanted to know before you went into that release cycle, what you were going to do. So all decisions on what was going to be in the release cycle were made at the time of start or before. And so the feature freeze for the release cycle was frozen yeah, if you look at this, this is six to 18 months. So your freeze happened maybe one month before that. So seven months to, to 24 months before releases when you check selected what you were going to release. So you have amazingly long release cycle for even the smallest change. Um, at the same time, uh, in the 1990s, there's good old Eric Raymond in the 19. 80, 97, he wrote a blog and in 99, or 97, 99, he wrote a book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, which I bet you guys remember too. So there's the cathedral. It's a single, well-architected, you know, massive building. How could anything be better? I know that this is burned down, but I still love that picture. So, and then there's the bazaar, like, um, you want to, you know, talk about redundancy and inefficient. That's the bazaar. And he basically started out looking at the bazaar like Linux being a bazaar. How could something like that possibly work in software engineering? He knew for a fact that you have to have this great architected design of a system in order for it to work. And then he saw that Linux was actually successful. He tried some of that nonsense himself and found it was actually really worked well. And he wrote the, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, like the, the theme. Uh, with, when you have plenty of eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And you can't, the, um, in fact, uh, corporate enterprise systems can't compete with open source because the open source can bring one or two orders of magnitude more attention to any problem than anybody can actually pay for. So uh, as unlikely as it seemed, 1990s was when we had open source at the same time that we had a lot of uh, client servers. So good old uh, Linux in 1991 decided to start an operating system just for fun. And at the same time, some, some developers from Champaign Urbana that were working on um, that we're working on HP, one of these web servers, 
they decided that they were going to start a group to support it. Uh, by 99, IBM was investing a billion dollars in Linux. And by 99, the Apache <coughs> Software Foundation was formed. <coughs> and today Apache uses, is used by over 40% of all the websites. So themes. First of all, we had the cathedral. In the 90s was when we got really big on plan the work and work the plan. Use standard processes, right? That's when it got to be really, really the thing. Um, it was not quite so much in the 80s. And then we got the bizarre at the same time, free and open software where you didn't have a process, you didn't have a plan, you did have committers. You had a typically a uh, benevolent dictator and some committers that reviewed code, um, but no process, no plan, and guess what, better software. Um, and the other thing that happened in the 90s, which you will all remember, was that the world was about to fall apart in 2000, yes, when the calendar flipped. And so for the last at least three years, everybody, everybody in any enterprise environment was spending almost all time doing code remediation so that they didn't die. Um, you know, my daughter didn't understand why we weren't stockpiling stuff because you know, it was gonna be doomsday. And I said, you know what, Andrea, I programmed those computers that everybody is worried about. And back when there were mini computers, you know, they didn't, they didn't have uh, batteries or anything. When you plugged it in, there was no date. You had to enter it. Otherwise, there was no date. And so the fact is that anybody would be a fool to depend on the date being accurate if they programmed on any of those computers. There's no way because the date was never right. And so the idea that when the date changed, everything was gonna fall apart was hinged on the idea that people were, this might've been true in non-engineering type work like in, in uh, uh, the IT departments, but it was certainly not true in engineering computers. I just didn't see the fact that the water systems of the world were gonna fall apart. She says, but we've stuck piled water in our basement. I said, you know what? We've got a great big water heater, that's good enough. <laughs> so um, there was a huge amount of stuff spent in getting ready for Y2K uh, at the same time as you know the internet was creeping up on people. So that's the 1990s, any comments? Yeah, Mary, if I can add something that, you know, one thing I saw happen in the 90s was the business people directly benefiting from software started to see major business benefits. Yes. And the capability, um, the capacity of the technology departments couldn't deliver anything like what people wanted. And rather than spend enough money, which very few companies did, the ones that did, I think, prospered a lot. But um, rather than spend enough money, people built these elaborate release cycles where you have to plan what's going to be in the release for a long time. Yes. And then it takes a long time to get it. And I think a lot of that was really around um, artificially constrained spending on technology with business people at the top not understanding the benefits yet in general. Well, I think that's part of that's it. Changed, but I also, that didn't ahead. change until now, I think. So. What? Yeah. I don't think that really changed until very recently. I agree that there was just too much demand, but I also agree that part of this cycle was because of dependencies too. Yeah, part of it was. I, I think yeah, that the I mean, was, really did agree. everyone's dependent upon the VSAM file structure, right? And so yeah. if you're gonna change the VFAM, VSAM file structure, it's really hard and you gotta plan the hell out of it. And you yeah. had a lot of dependencies. So absolutely true, I agree with that as well. Um, uh, that's part of the reason it got together. But the other thing that I saw like at 3M was there was huge effort, lots and lots of resources dedicated to creating a big integrated normalized database because then the business would have a, a single way to look at each customer and see how it did stuff. And so some of the requests, the business thought that they could be good, but it was not just that it wasn't funded. I think it was also because the concept of what could be done was not necessarily well thought out. Yeah, people wasted a lot of money trying things that wouldn't work, but yeah. that's how you yeah. learn, I guess. Well, let's, you know, you can either not. learn by spending a little money or learn by spending a lot. And because all projects were big, they learned by spending a lot. 
That's yeah, right. let's not let's not forget the dot com bubble. Yeah, the dot com. This is right about here is when Google started, right in at the end of the decade in 1999. Um, the and I think the bubble happened in the early 2000s. Yeah. No, it, it was it was 2000 actually. Yeah. 2000. Uh, By 99, one... we were just starting to get some seriously interesting internet companies. Yeah. The, and... trend, uh, the trend I would add would be P2P, peer-to-peer, -peer. Ah, Nap yeah. Napster particularly, Inter in, uh, became, became, you know, it just blew, it blew the, the top off of um, the, the notion you didn't have to have a central computer. You could yes. all these computers could all talk to each other and share. Yes, Bit, BitTorrent just uh, came along later, but but yes. uh, Napster, Napster was the one that drove it in the in the nineties. Right, and the other thing that I saw, uh, I, I can't tell you if it was the <clears throat> late nineties or the early two thousands, was the concept that um, you could have a array of disks, and they would be more reliable or array of hardware or array of anything and it would be way more reliable than this a great big single one uh, that was which is uh, how google built it yes google um, Plus. but the yeah. uh the paper that proposed that was about mid 90s and it was really novel i can't remember its name right now but that whole idea that arrays were better than big things came up in the 90s for sure I think the other thing that I saw, and this is Hans here, was uh, the increasing adoption of things like uh, we're going to ship all our work overseas and that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, for sure. Okay. And the, you know, the, the horror that brought to the systems just simply because of things like Conway's Law and that kind of stuff. Right? Yes. So. And, and well, because it was, especially as Y2K readiness came in, a yeah. lot of that work was sent overseas. And then they said, oh, that's cheaper. You know, you don't have to pay people as much. Yeah. And I'm, I'm positive that through the 2000s, at least through the first half, um, if you weren't doing outsourcing, you were considered just a really bad CIO. Yeah. yeah but and it, by the but way, it, I, still, I still think that attitude applies in many places, right? So. But, Does it, it? But, it, but it didn't start from cost efficiency, at least uh, I was at I was at Charles Schwab in, in uh, 96, 97, 98, 99. And what caused it was you couldn't find you you couldn't hire a Java programmer in those days. You couldn't hire a C plus plus programmer. They were all taken. the the uh, The bubble was was consuming. Yes, that right. All yes. of programming. You didn't, you didn't want to work at a, at a corporation. You wanted to work at a startup company and make a billion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That's just especially in your area. Yeah, and then Mary, I think the other thing I would add to this uh, in the 80s and the 1990s was I saw a huge explosion in, in project management discipline. Yes. And, and, and management styles changed. I mean, significant organization and management styles changed, which added complexity and confusion on top of <laughs> everything else that was going oh, you on. Just, you just like hit, the, hit one of my sore spots. So. I have read in several places that this Y2K readiness thing is the thing that introduced projects into the IT world. Up until this time, we didn't actually really have projects. We had business, we worked with business people to do things, but they weren't projects. Then you got project managers who basically were not expected to actually understand the technology. And then if a project manager doesn't need to understand the technology, why does a manager need to understand the technology? So you have stuff, all the technical stuff going away. And the idea that somebody who really has no experience with the technology is a fine manager, as long as they just do the management part, right? I think a massive mistake. Yeah, I think, you know, at um, in some companies, Mary, project management was there before. So certainly I was at Norwest at the time and ah. the first bank system, and we had project management and big banks. Um, but I think that with project Man with Y2K, it became a clear business risk. And so some business units wanted to have their own control over it to make sure we didn't screw it up. And so they would put a project manager over it who was really just a pure process manager yep. to make sure here's the list of systems and yeah, are they going through I definitely through think that process came in around 
Exactly. It, it did because it, it, put the, the it put the whole business at risk and the technology is mysterious. And so putting those kind of controls in was yeah. comforting and probably actually a good idea. So. I'm not sure about that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the uh, other thing that I was thinking of was the ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, yes. is something that came about as well, and it was right. you know, gaining traction across the board. ERP the was 90s. gaining traction, and the way I saw ERP was the drive for a central ERP database. So you, you didn't have little pieces of ERP doing this, that, and the other thing. You had an ERP system, which you kept folding more and more stuff into, right? Yeah. And so that's that when really SAP and it. Oracle, they introduced their software, ERP software. Definitely. So that really focused on the centralization of stuff. And when you get big batches like that, um, lots of stuff doesn't work so well. So we kind of started to fall apart then. Let's go into 2000s, the first decade. And this is the year that Extreme Programming Explained came out. And the next year is when the Agile Manifesto came out. So this is also the decade of working software. I'm not going to say much about this decade because you all remember it anyway. So, Because here's my thing about it. As much as we started doing Agile, we never actually spent a lot of time making sure we were building the right thing. Um, we were trying to be agile and do stuff, but there is very little in there about software engineers responsible for understanding the whole system and the proper role of their piece of the system and what it was supposed to be doing and um, that sort of thing. And I just didn't see that uh, in that agile movement in the 2010s. It was a lot about process and not very much at all about understanding what the role, what your role in the software world was and whether or not what you were building was important and needed. Mary, so I, I want to answer Gopa's, uh, the, the question so that I, I put off. I was going to say, Mary, there's so much business value then so the target environment was so rich with benefits, right? So that as a software engineering manager, you didn't have to look for things. There were just things that were high value all over the place. So okay. I'm not making an excuse, but I think that was the case. So much benefit. So you don't have to look very hard to make a lot of money for your company. Okay, that was your experience. What I saw an awful lot of was people grappling to in enterprises grappling to do this new process to you know do things better faster cheaper because of cost pressures and um not thinking about what what was really important what do we really need to spend our time on so there was a question i deferred um i think you're still here was it from gopal yeah i'm here mary could you re-ask that question Oh, I was asking about how the strategy, enterprise strategy is related to the enterprise architecture and overall systems architecture. What are your thoughts on those? Start again. How is what related to the overall system architecture? The enterprise strategy. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure what you, I'm trying to figure out what you're asking. So I don't so, understand your question. So generally in an organization, they talk about strategy, which is disconnected from, you know, how we build things, uh, assuming it's a product development organization, right? And there is an architecture associated with it, or if it is a organization that is having a lot of, you know, technical systems, there is an enterprise architecture associated with it. Are these connected? in some way, or do you feel like they are two separate things which are- Strategy and architecture? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think back of, uh, I really have always thought that if you have a strategy and it's a way to move forward with technology, okay? Because there can be a lot of strategies that have nothing to do with software technology, okay? 
But if your strategy is built on software technology, say go back to Bell Labs or something like that, their strategy was to make electronic all of their relay systems. So if you have a strategy that is built on electronics, the very first, maybe the middle and probably the lab, but for sure, the first thing you have to think about is what is the underlying sets of technology and the architecture of those technologies that are going to help me do that? And why is my strategy better than my competitors? So that's maybe the first question. Why is what I think is cool going to get me you know, ahead? Why is it good? And if you're just digging somebody else's architecture out and trying to implement some idea on it, you haven't done anything particularly new or novel. And so if you're trying to get out there with something, a strategy that gives you some, some you know, traction that, that's interesting, that's, that's competitive against other kinds of strategies, you probably have to, are thinking about some new uses of technology. And if you haven't figured out how the underlying architecture is going to support that, um, then you're not doing anything much new. I really think that what I've seen is typically really serious breakthroughs are whole new ways of looking at things. I mean, if you look at artificial intelligence, for example, we did some artificial intelligence things, but back when I was doing control programming, but it didn't really break out until the compute power caught up with it. And um, you could finally do neural networks, for example. But the, the concept of in 2012, we, we uh, had a major breakthrough in artificial intelligence. And the way that it happened was that um, there was a professor, what's her name? Um, who decided that everybody else was wrong when they were thinking about artificial intelligence. It wasn't about the algorithms. It was about the data that people used for learning. And so she spent two, three, four, five years um, figuring out how to create an image database where she gathered just tons and tons and millions of images. And she used Mechanical Turk um, to, and had her graduate students monitor the people who were doing tagging of all of these images. And then she instituted, Fifi Lee, that's her name. Um, she instituted a, a challenge called the Image Challenge. And every year she, the, the, they put out a subset of the pictures and had people test their algorithms against it to see which algorithms could recognize the most pictures because she felt it was the data set that was necessary to figure out how to make algorithms go ahead. It wasn't about a better algorithm. Well, in 2012, um, a team in Toronto just um, doubled their, the capability of image recognition from, 20, from having a 25% a error to about 15% or 10% error. So they did a massive improvement on every other algorithm. It might not seem like much to you, but Google took note. They hired the entire, the, the major professor and the entire staff of the, the guys in Toronto and put them on, and then they hired Fifi Lee. And that is the whole beginning of when we started to seeing artificial intelligence. And we started seeing artificial intelligence because some person had a completely different way of looking at what was important and how you architected for it. So she built an image database, which based and then put together image challenges, which completely changed the way everybody was looking at artificial intelligence. So a strategy requires a, usually requires a different mental model of how the world would work. And if you don't have a different mental model, it's not a strategy, it's a copycat. And I think having a, a you know, completely different perspective on what we can do is every time I see a major change here, I see somebody coming in with an absolutely different mental model of how you achieve something. And that new mental model turns out to work. Now there's lots of mental models that don't work, but when the ones do work, then you get a really good thing. So I'm not sure I answered your question though. Uh, no, 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 that is 
I was just asking your experience on it, and thanks for sharing it, Mary. There is no, you know, I yeah. wasn't looking for a specific answer. I was looking okay. for more yeah, sharing I, of it. I, I see strategy as having a, um, a different, okay, so our technology is moving all the time. And every, every year, it's going to catch up with problems that people are, are suffering, okay? And those problems people have gotten used to solving in some way, and some brilliant person is going to take a different look at it and say, you know, given this new technology and this problem that I already understand, I could do a better job of solving it. And to me, all of the different of the major steps forward are, are a combination of that. Technology catches up with a problem and somebody is in the position to understand the technology, look at the problem and say, there's a match. I can do things better than they've ever been done before if I just look at this thing differently. And um, every, to me, every single, that's the sort of footprint of every single advance that I've seen. And, Thank you, Mary. And, it, it, and it, you know, it's actually not about strategy. It's about matching new technologies in a novel way with a problem that's been around. So, okay, let's go to 2000 uh, themes. Oh, yeah, well, all right. So what we had was multidiscipline teams, yep. Because coordinating across disciplines is the hard part. And coordinating in a discipline is much easier. We had incremental delivery. Okay, so we used to have large processes, projects, long release cycles, and they started falling out of favor. Once before that, that was like, that was epitome of professionalism. And here's the bad part about the 2000s. We introduced almost um, institutionalized proxies. Um, customer representative, that's what XP called it. Product owner, that's what Scrum calls it. The business, that's sort of left over from, those are all proxies. And it was a time when we should have started getting rid of proxies, but instead they became uh, institutionalized in the agile processes. And I think that's the biggest, that's the biggest problem with agile Barna is that they've institutionalized the concept of proxies between the engineers and the problem. And as, as you pointed out too, you used to sit right by the people with the problems. And if you're doing what's really engineering, you do not have proxies between you and the problem. And so that's the, this was good, multidiscipline teams, incremental delivery was really good, but proxies were a big mistake. Okay. So much for 2000s, go to 2010. That's the decade of flow. So this bo these books came out in 2010 and 2012. And, um, they are very important, especially the continuous delivery book, because it was aimed at enterprises and talked about even if you're in an enterprise, you can actually you can actually do continuous integration, continuous delivery on your whole code base all of the time. And um, some people got it real fast and jumped on it. Some people took longer time. But if you haven't figured out how to do it today, you are like really behind the times. So what's the biggest bottleneck with flow? I'll tell you what I think, okay? So you don't have to guess. To me, the biggest bottleneck is dependencies. You can't have flow if you have significant dependencies. And to me, dependencies are an architectural problem. They are not a process problem. And by trying to make them a process problem, that's a mistake. Um, we need to figure out how we attack dependencies architecturally. So here is the old enterprise architecture. This is, I actually um, picked this up out of a book because I wasn't really sure what it ever looked like, but let's pretend this is the enterprise architecture. Um, and the important thing for sure was that there's one system of record, right? One system that's the right system that is the real, the real thing. Um, but the problem with that is you have now a massive dependency generator because that one system of record means every single application has to use it and you change one little piece of data somewhere and you have to check everything else that uses it. So I think the central database is the biggest, um, is the biggest dependency generator we've had to deal with. And the concept that you didn't need it was really hard to shed. I remember when I 
Um, well, I'll tell you that in a minute. So here's a smartphone architecture about 2007. And here, what you're doing is building apps that don't talk to each other on an underlying technology platform, right? That's what you're doing. And the smartphone architecture was fine, but hey, it's just for apps on smartphones. That's not even software, right? But if you take a look at microservice architecture, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, you build on a technology prop platform, you build apps that don't talk to each other. And the interesting thing here is they have distributed data stores and you don't have that central database anymore. To me, the most novel part about this is you don't have that central database anymore. I remember Mike Nygaard was giving us a presentation here. He used to live here and we went to a presentation he was giving on this new thing called the cloud and it was in I don't know, 2004 or five, something like that. And he was talking about what Amazon was doing with the cloud. And, and, he, and he said that they don't have central databases anymore. They just have these apps or these, these uh, services. And I thought, oh, come on. I mean, that's impossible. Everybody knows you have to have a central database if you do transactions, yes. And I figured either they knew something I didn't know or they were going to, be in bad shape. And it turns out they knew something I didn't know. You don't have to have that central database, but there are so many companies that just can't walk away from it um, because it's so ingrained in our, in our ERP mentality that you have to have a central database. But a microservice architecture or a smartphone architecture, whatever you call it, has small things that only communicate through very strict protocols they don't interact with each other. And so they're, they're just natively low, low dependencies. And it's this low dependency architecture. It's exactly the way the internet looks for God's sake. And if you wanna scale, you actually have to have something that looks like that because otherwise you can't scale. So that's um, what I saw in the 2010s. But now what do we have? Look at all those teams that we got in a microservice architecture. Tons and tons of teams. They own their own service. You build it, you own it, as uh, I've heard, right? So how can you have all these small teams work together to accomplish the overall mission? This has become the question that everybody asks. And it's a question that hasn't been solved by too many companies, not even internet companies, not even, for example, people talk about the Spotify model, but they struggle and still struggle with this question because they're too big on autonomy. Um, because these guys have a platform that defines their interactions, but they also um, need something else. So if you wanna figure out how do you get all sorts of small teams to work together to accomplish a whole mission, if you get to that point in an agile transformation and you have an architecture that's fragmented, what do you do next? So here's my model, and it's because I'm an engineer, and I like the responsible engineer model. So what's this is, uh, you know, a um, Falcon rocket with a payload, second stage, third stage. And what you have is a chief engineer for the entire vehicle. And then you have a chief engineer, sub-chief engineer for this payload and the sub-chief engineer for second stage and for first stage. Then you have a sub chief engineer for the set of engines. And then you have a sub, a very, very senior chief engineer for just one Merlin engine. And there is a Merlin engine engineer, but believe me, is a really senior position in the company. And every one of these different components has a chief engineer with a relatively um, uh, focused staff on just that problem. There is no software department. There is a second stage group and a first stage group. And the, at the top of that is an, a responsible engineer who owns responsibility for making sure that their thing works really well, does the right thing as part of the overall mission. And their job is to understand the overall mission. So if you think about this, the whole game for the first five years was how do we land these things so we can reuse them, right? They, they, You've, I bet, seen the films of them crashing and crashing this way and crashing that way. And, um, and that was good engineering. 
Because if you waited until you were sure you were not going to have any crashes, you'd never get anywhere. Instead, they could rebuild things better and faster if they would set a deadline and say, we are going to launch on this date. And if you, um, and you better know, you better have your piece ready. And you know, if it causes a crash, you've got 24 hours before you better know exactly what went wrong and be able to tell Musk when he calls you exactly what you're gonna to do to make sure that it never happens again. So you can bet every single one was instrumented with a ton of software and video cameras and stuff like that. That was the job of the chief engineer. So you've got lots and lots of small engineering teams, but they're coordinated through the system engineering structure of the vehicle. Airplanes work like this. Um, yeah. Any large system engineering area works like this. Yeah. Oh, sorry, just a quick question. Do you think that responsible engineer needs to have positional authority in order to kind of make that happen? Or do you think they could be just a senior engineer that's a member of the team, but would somehow be able to exert? Well, the, the responsible engineer for the second stage is responsible for the second stage and has the engineers under in his group, which he is responsible for. Whether it's a reporting or not, those engineers in their group, he's responsible for making sure they know what their part is and that they do it right and they know the deadlines and that they meet them. Mm -hmm. and, and that cascades down through the whole second stage, through all of the things. I am split on whether or not it's a, um, whether or not people should report into a function or into the um, system architecture organization structure because I've seen it work well both ways. But it is absolutely clear that every stage has a chief engineer or whatever you want to call responsible engineer, resp completely responsible for it, responsible for communicating their role with all the rest and then also responsible for any sub chief engineers in that area to know exactly what they need to do and what their deadlines are and what their interactions are and so on. So you have cascading responsibility for the next launch through this whole thing. If the people on your team do not report to you, then their reporting manager is responsible to make sure that, that you are properly staffed so you can do your job. And we okay. tended to do it more like that at 3M. We tended to have chief, uh, chief engineers, but the people on the team were assigned by, by uh, worked for and were assigned by functional managers, you know, discipline managers. And um, their job was to make sure that their people completely and 100% supported your project, your, your module or something like that. And everybody was judged on the success here but the reporting structure could go both ways. But there's no question that everybody working on the payload team is completely responsible for the payload. Yeah. And everybody working on the first stage team is completely responsible for that. And the overall chief engineer is completely responsible to make sure all the subject engineers, one level down, maybe even two level down, have a very clear idea when the next deadline is and what their part is to make it happen and what good performance is, technically good performance. So that's a really classic systems engineering model that is any large vehicle, all of the automotive vehicle programs that in Japan work this way. Um, and, and it works. Now, you've got tons of teams and they all know what to do because they understand the mission. They understand the next deadline and what's going to happen, you know, when it's going to launch and what they have to do to make sure that launch is successful. And they are completely responsible to make sure it happens. Okay. And I've, I've not seen um, really big program. This is a really big program. I've not seen really big programs work <coughs> very well if you try to split off the disciplines and then try to coordinate them. I just haven't seen it. But, you know, every large vehicle, every large, really large system program works under that principle. And in this principle, you don't have software teams. And Mary, we'll the, reason talk about why, the reason why you need to have um, competency areas, however, is you can have software people in each one of these and each one of them can be doing similar kind of stuff. So they need to have a competency home 
in order to learn, <coughs> in order to understand what good practice is, in order to have training in their area, and in order to coordinate their work across the whole area. Mayor, I think you're so right on this. And I'll talk about this a little bit next week when I do my talk to this group. Um, this idea of a chief engineer, I think is completely missing in Agile. And Agile puts um, kind of, in, in my mind, the basic scrum model, it, it, it's missing this idea of the chief engineer completely, right? It doesn't well, have engineers it, in charge of anything, right? Well, so, yeah, but Agile has historically been terrified of managers. I mean, yeah. if you look at its roots, it has, it's founded by people who think managers are terrible. Absolutely. You know, and anybody was, you, you can't have somebody responsible because <laughs> then they might be bad. Yeah, you can't have a really senior person who's well respected in the company and connected. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, because like, those kind of people don't exist. So, you know, I can't agree. Uh, I just don't <laughs> buy that. Yeah. Um, if you have a really, really deeply technical thing in a massive program and you don't have really good engineering, then forget it. And this is really good engineering. This is the, the bigger it is, the more likely it is to look like this. And this is not, does it scale? This is a, if you scale, how can you do it any other way? I actually haven't seen it. So then if we go to, remember this? It was February 6, 2018 when Falcon Heavy with three of those Falcon rocket kits went up and two of them landed. And oh, I tell you, when I saw this, I was like blown away. So here's the interesting thing. From 1970 to 2000, so that's a lot of years, it cost about $18,500 to put a kilogram of weight into space. Right now, it's less than 3,000. So this is a factor of seven to one. And that's because they decided that, it, that the, one of the most important things was to have reusable components. Nobody had a clue how to engineer reusable components. When I heard that they were gonna do it, I thought they were crazy. Yes, and so did you, right? Um, but they weren't crazy, they figured it out. Um, and they figured it out through the classic engineering approach of not thinking through everything, but setting deadlines. My next launch is in three months, setting interim deadlines in the vicinity for a big program of three, four months apart, saying this is what we're gonna have accomplished by here and they don't move the deadline because launches don't move. Every team is responsible to make sure they do their part and understand what their part is. So it's the, this responsibility. Your teams are responsible for the design and development of a component, for making sure that component operates properly and does its job as a part of the overall system. And that's how you coordinate a lot of teams. Every team doesn't just do what it wants. It does its part working with the other parts to make sure the system works. And if the teams don't have a system perspective on mission, yeah, I don't know how you coordinate them. And this is Matroni, this, the launch director. He says that no engineering process in existence can replace the philosophy of responsibility for getting things done right and efficiently. They're in it. So, 2010 themes, and then we're going to go to 2020, I promise. Oh boy, it's getting late, but that's okay. We have enough time. So infrastructure as code is really actually a rather large breakthrough because suddenly we don't have data centers. We have the cloud. I remember when I told people the cloud's in your future and they told me I was crazy. Well, guess what? I wasn't. Um, uh, we have a very big focus on breaking dependencies with smartphone architecture and independent deployment, and then we have the responsible team, which I just talked about. So let's go now to 2020. In Minnesota, this was March 17th, maybe the next week. Tom and I had been in New York for a couple of weeks, so we came home, and actually we, we may have brought the virus with us. We came home with bad, bad colds that we eventually got over, but we don't know. Anyway, the that week, everything changed, and schools had to go home, businesses had to close, people had a day, no, maybe they had three days, sometimes they had till the end of the week, and there was no moving the deadline, everything had to be changed. Everybody had to work from home, um, schools had to be taught remotely, professors had to learn how to do it, kindergarten teachers had to learn how to do it, kids needed to have laptops, there had to be figured out how to get Wi-Fi out there, what about the lunches, there was just all kinds of stuff. And what we learned when that happened was resilience isn't a luxury. If you don't have resilience, you're not 
you know, when our supply chains broke on certain things, it was a, uh, we don't have a resilient system here. It's just way, be, may, way too efficient. So here's the two, one question I want to talk about. Two questions actually, but maybe it's the same. How do you prepare for a black swan event? So this is Iceland. I don't know if you've ever been to Iceland, but it's got a ring road all the way around it. And this here, this is a glacier. And, um, and up here, there's like the center area, there's all kinds of glaciers and it gets lots of ice. And, and every so often a volcano goes off and it goes off at different places, but usually it goes off in the center. And the volcano, basically what it does is it melts a whole ton of ice. Because it doesn't even, you know, there's, there's so much ice that it doesn't always even get loose. It just melts stuff. So you get, every few years, you get ice melt, and then spring comes and summer comes. And then that ice is pooled up there in some big lake somewhere. And it comes crashing down almost always into this valley right here and out to the ocean. And when it does that, it wipes out the bridge. So they have pictures of this thing flooding back from the times when you could start taking pictures and of bridges that were wiped out in this area because the, you know, the, the pool of water broke loose and wiped out the bridge. And this is a monument, actually there's a picnic table here if you look really close, to a decision that they made the last time that the bridge broke. And this is the last time the bridge was wiped out. And they said, you know, Every time we do this, we try to build the bridge bigger and sturdier so that the next time there's a flood, it can, it can handle it. And no matter how many times we do that, it still gets wiped out. Maybe we should take a different approach. What if we would just buy the fact that it's going to get wiped out every you know, 10, 15 years and stockpile the stuff we need so that when it gets wiped out, we can build it up again real fast because you know, you're not gonna go there when it's flooding anyway. So they, they, there's a sign here that says, what we decided to do was to quit worrying about building our great big bridge and start worrying about being able to rebuild the bridge when it gets wiped out. And that's what I mean by resilience. Forget about having something that's never gonna fail and start having something that when it gets wiped out, because it's going to get wiped out, we don't know when, we have no idea, you know, 10 years, 15 years, but it's going to happen, then you better be prepared. And I think if you look at the architecture that I mentioned for large scale, it's the same for resilience. You have to have some sort of redundancy. So they have stockpiled everything they need to build a new bridge fast. Anything that they're going to need, they're going to have around handy. You need to have some amount of isolation. When that bridge is wiped out, that's the only part of the ring road that should go. And by the way, there might be some little tiny roads in there with small bridges that you could put up really fast while you're building your new big bridge. But you need to isolate your pieces so that you don't have cascading failures like we did at, like the Bell Labs ESS computers did. And you need to have local control because, and, and if you go back to my very first slide, this was the mark of a scalable architecture because, you know, we had um, internet go down here for three days in January and we lost, we lost the ability to, um, you know, our vacuum cleaner, our little automatic vacuum cleaner didn't work. Uh, none of our smart devices worked that we could talk to. We couldn't turn on our lights with voice, none of that. The only thing that worked was when we had a local controller in the house. And these kinds of things where you design for resi resilience you need an architecture that is going to have, you know, limited blast radius. That's another way of looking at isolation. Local control of stuff because you can't really expect some central cloud to solve all of your problems. And you have to have redundancy. Therefore, you can't have super efficiency. You have to figure out how to have, what is the right kind of redundancy. The other thing you need to do is think about your organization, okay? So you also have to organize and thinking about Conway's law. So I would take a look at this book here. It's called Sense and Respond. It's by Jeff Gothel and uh, Josh Scheiden. And they talk about um, how you can be resilient by being very responsive to what's happening. And 
at all times, you need to maintain a continuous two-way conversation with the market. So to me, that's like the essence of building an organization that is responsive to what's going on, is constantly being in touch with the market that you're trying to serve. So that's where we get small, multidisciplined teams that involve everybody. In this model, there is no business. Okay, any more than at SpaceX, you have a software department. There is no IT department. There are teams that delight customers. Now think about it. When the pandemic hit and everybody had to go home, you were not using any of our software processes to solve the problems. You threw four people together that could solve the problem and said, have at it and, you know, and you'll know you're successful when everybody, you know, <coughs> whatever you can do in four days you do. And we need to have, you know, we need to have curbside delivery working or we need to have uh, whatever. So lots of, you put whole teams together to attack the problems. You did not put a business and then asking a software group to, to sort of back them up. In fact, we had one custom, one store around here that was trying to compete in the area of curbside pickup that simply couldn't get their act together. And I, I liked them, you know, I don't use them anymore, but I liked them because they had, uh, but they, I kept saying, well, you know, why can't you fix this problem? Why, well, we have to wait until our software contractor is ready to help us. And that just didn't happen fast enough. The companies that respond, responded fast were the companies that put multiple different kinds of people on a problem and solved it fast. And so if you had to very rapidly move from when 2% of your customers were doing drive up pickup to when 20, 30, 40% of your customers <coughs> were doing drive up pickup, all of a sudden you had to hire people, you had to figure out how to stage things, you had to figure out how to do systems that weren't going to allow you to do errors. You had to figure out how to get inventory online. It was accurate. You had to figure out how to take it off when it was accurate. You had all kinds of different people besides software that all of them had to get together in one single team and solve the problem. And the problem has to be real clear. The outcome's real, real um, obvious. Um, and the constraints have to be there. If you have to be home in three days, you have to be home in three days. That's a constraint that's not gonna go away. So the real constraints have to be clear to the team. The other thing is these teams have to be able to act asynchronously and without permission. And you know what? That's an architecture problem. That's where architecture has to be there to support independence and asynch asynchronous uh, operation of teams. They don't need to get permission from management. They've had a charter, that's what they need. They don't need to get permission from their colleagues. The system is designed so that they can act by themselves or a small group of teams. The responsibility for making the decisions on what to build is with the team deciding what to build. It is not with somebody else. It's inside of the team that is responsible for solving a problem. You need to have a lot of feedback very fast in order to do what these guys in the book say is learn your way forward. So very frequent delivery to customers with really good feedback. And you have to measure success by consumer output comes, not by output, not by proxies, but by the impact or the output on the person for whom you're building the software or on the people for whom you're building the product. So with that, I'm gonna just show you three themes that I think are important right now. One is rapid change, which basically, if it's a decade old, it's obsolete. If it's two decades old, it's time to abandon it. And, and there's a reason for that. And that is because um, I've never seen anything, any process, any, you name it, that's 20 years old that is really useful right now today. We have to start thinking about when something gets to be about a decade old, we gotta find what this decade is all about, not what that decade was all about. And when you get to 20 years old, especially if you get to 20 year old processes, I'm sorry, but I've never seen one that really works anymore. 
And that includes all of those processes that came in here right about the year 2000. Um, principles work, okay? Themes work, but frameworks, no. You need to, we, we need to start thinking about how do, we, how do we solve for consumers, for the people using our work? How do we optimize for outcomes and for impact as opposed to optimizing for whatever else we want to optimize for? And systems thinking. So to mimic the Agile Manifesto, we need to value responsiveness, flow, and resilience over predictability, efficiency, and stability. So any comments on that? Well, this is Jay. You know, a lot of uh, people are now trying to build Agile 2.0 or whatever. I mean, there's people out there working on the new whatever. I think the principles, like you said before, and values, you know, those are still salable today. I think a lot of what you mentioned as the practical actions that we have to take uh, to uh, build better teams and have teams working together, multidiscipline teams. That I think that's where the crux of the things that are right now. They're trying to scale things. They're trying to use. But what are they trying to scale? Stuff and it's not working. It's not working. Of course not, because because they're solving the wrong problem. Um. Why is agile important now? What, what, what happens is if it's 20 years old, the good stuff has been appropriated into the, the way we do things, okay? And the bad stuff is sort of what's left out flopping in the wind. So um, we have really, really good techniques for continuous delivery, for um, continuous integration, for really good testing, for um, being able to deploy and then back out if there's anything wrong. We've got amazing technology that we've developed to allow ourselves to do all of this rapid deployment and feedback and stuff like that. But that wasn't because of this process. That was because um, the, the, the process encouraged teams to think about what kinds of tools I could use to get stuff done faster and to get stuff done better and to get more feedback. And as it, people started thinking about that, it's not the process that's the important thing. It's the what is the objective of what you're trying to accomplish? You are trying to make some impact, some, some, some impact on somebody. You are trying to make a market. You are trying to put a product out there that is great. You are trying to solve some sort of a problem because um, the pandemic has changed everything and now my store has to have a whole different set of software for people who want to drive it or whatever. So you have specific problems and you have to figure out how to attack those problems. And we have put together under the Agile sort of banner, a large amounts of technology. But the problem with Agile is it forgets, this is about technology. This is about engineering. This isn't actually about process. Um, I've seen every single process I've ever seen has come and gone. And it tends to leave behind in its wake a bunch of really good technologies. Um, I'm biased. I'm an engineer, so <laughs> it's. it's you know, I, I appreciate that, Mary. And I, this is Tom. And I, I, I there's, I, I agree as a developer myself that that definitely, Agile has lost sight of the importance of the engineering side of the equation. Oh no, no, I never had sight. Well, regardless, it my point is I there are too you. many there are too many organizations I've been in where even though the, the technology really wasn't the toughest problem. I mean, I, and, and forgive me for sounding like an agilist at this point, but it was a people problem, you oh, know? So, yeah, yeah. Right? I, agree. I, agree. I mean, so so I, I, I have to disagree a little bit and say, yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. I get it. But there are a lot of organizations where it's like, yeah, technology ain't your problem. Well, I agree. But remember, who, who was it that said, where did we come from when we got all of these people that didn't understand technology doing all of the, the managing and the project management? Fair enough. Fair and enough. so, yes, I agree that in the end, it's people problems. But I also don't see us 
thinking about the problem in a way that um, in a way that's going to solve the people problems. So if you put people there that aren't intimately familiar with how what are we doing and how are we trying to accomplish whatever it is is our goal and what are the tools that we need to accomplish the goal and people that can really understand how to ask those questions and attack them then you're going to get a process out of it and that's interesting you know and it might even help but in the end you have to figure out what are the underlying themes which is what i've been trying to talk about what are the underlying themes that stand the test of time and what are the themes that don't Thank and you. figure out how to pull that theme forward and um, make that the important thing rather than uh, making you know today's process framework important because today's process framework will be obsolete in 10 years no question um, so we need to have we need to figure out um, it's not it's not about agile, it's about, we've come a long ways in the last 20 years. We've made major steps and we haven't gone back on many of the important ones. And we did change from um, a more, uh, more grouped vertical, you know, silo type organizations to more cross-functional, that's true. And that was really good. And that is, that is a great organization, but in the process, we lost the connection of that group with the problem. And that's really bad. Yeah, yeah. The people who wrote the Agile Manifesto were largely people who were not employed by organizations. They were largely people that took orders and implemented something that somebody else told them to do. The, most of them are our friends, we love them. But that's where they came from. And as such, they were responsible for having a approach that would allow them to do what they were told to do at low cost and pretty quick. And that's what they did. But they were not responsible for the results of what they produced. They had no responsibility for the profitability, they had no responsibility for the impact on the customers who were supposed to benefit from it. Um, they were not involved as a product. They were involved solely as a machine to execute the, um, what somebody told them what to do. And that was a reaction. The, to the 90s where um, the whole waterfall um, absurdity was dominant, but it was only reacting against part of what the problem was. It was reacting against the, how do we do what we're told to do rather than why aren't we given responsibility for making a difference and that is the problem. The people who wrote the Agile Manifesto, the people that did most of the initial work on Scrum um, and other approaches were not responsible for the product. They were not responsible for the impact. They were responsible for doing what they were told. And I don't know why anybody would expect that kind of approach to work in a very, very complex situation that software has been and is increasingly becoming. Tom, that's a really a wise observation, I think. I mean, you see in the Agile Manifesto things like, you know, business people work with us every day. Well, that distinction's built in, right? And then the idea yeah. of a product owner, which is this is the person who can actually tell me reliably what's needed. Bad move. We're tired of building stuff that no one ever uses, right? Can someone tell me what it means? Can someone give me, be around, answer my questions? Hey, like, I think that's a really that wise the, thing. And that, that takes, that? <laughs> go ahead. I agree uh, with you. It's really, how do you get past that? And I, I'll talk about that next week, right? Because that's what I've always been in big corporations, not exactly like you, Mary. Right? Yeah. I was never a software engineer. I've always been a technical leader, a technical manager. Yeah. Right? And so it's a different perspective, but I feel it so strongly, right? of how do you get that 
team ownership and the team of betting with the business while maintaining the technical skills, right? And how it's not just a cookbook, but what leadership skills do you need to actually do this work? Because we're doing something that people haven't done before, which is take this very complex set of ideas and turn them into code that runs. It's a hard problem. It's not a human thing. Um, I was going to ask you something, but I forgot. So never mind. Well, we're well, we're one minute over. I don't mind continuing if other people want to stay on. I mean, this is a that's a very good conversation because there is change in the wind, so this is very good. But we're at eight oh one. I'm recording. I'll send out the recording to everyone and publish it uh, on our our YouTube account. But yeah, if you well, ever want to stay it's on, I'm fine. o'clock now here and i got a 7 6 45 uh commitments around morning so i think maybe i'm gonna have to sign off about it okay. <laughs> but, okay. All yes, right. i don't have very much time left to get in a good night's sleep before i do an all morning thing in, in london so cool all right well thank, thank you so you. much thank you very much thank mary and tom and thank you everyone for joining us very interesting conversation. I think uh, the change is in the wind, so we'll see what happens. I hope so. <laughs> and, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm going to be signing off and go get some sleep, Mary. Yeah, I could use it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We're going to go.